Okay. Started the recording. Yeah. So last time we proved, um, you know, morphology duality by showing space level homology and space level cohomology are uh, homotopy equivalent. And so, you know, we're moving on to a slightly different topic. We're going to talk about classical configuration spaces. Um, and then, you know, there's scanning for these. Um, and we will uh, talk a little bit, you know, about applications to uh, computing homotopy groups of spheres. And then I'll talk about homological stability. And then I'll introduce compactly supported cohomology, which will be um, one of the tools that we'll use to prove stability. Okay, so the um, the ordered configuration space. Uh, so I'll only be focusing on configurations of points in a manifold, but um, you know this makes sense for M any space. Uh, so the, the ordered configuration space is just the subset of the um, space to the K uh, minus, uh, or the subspace where all the uh, tuples are distinct. So, you know, pair tuple M1 through MK, and, um, you know, each of the, each of the elements are distinct. So this is a open, open subspace of M to the K. And then there's a natural action of the symmetric group on this order configuration space where, um, a permutation just permutes the the order of the elements in the tuple, and then unordered configuration space is defined as the quotient of ordered configuration space by the action of symmetric group. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is a, a picture of ordered configuration space. Um, you know, permutations. You know, so we should think of it as part. You know, the manifold is this um, cylinder in this picture. You should think of it as like the space of points in the manifold, and each point is um, has a number um, has a distinct number like one through k, and um, and the points are all distinct and you know they can't collide. Um, yeah, and the symmetric group acts by like you know the permutation one four would swap the number one with the number four here in the labels. And then the uh, unordered configuration space is, you know, we have k distinct points, but they're indistinguishable. So here, I guess we have five, five distinct points. They can't collide. Um, you can't tell them apart. So like a, a loop in um, like a, a valid loop downstairs would be these two points swap places. And that would lift upstairs to a, a path, but that path wouldn't be a loop because, you know, the starting point would have the labels one, three, and the end point would have the labels three, one. Any, any questions? Yeah, so th these will be like the basic objects of study for the next um, few weeks. Um, so, you know, I guess I've been using the term configuration space sort of fairly generally. If this is sort of the um, most specific thing one could mean by configuration space. Okay, so there's a, a theorem due to McDuff and Siegel. Um, so the uh, that says if you have a connected uh, n manifold, then there's um, a scanning type map that goes from the configuration space of k points to um, this is the space of degree k sections of some bundle that I'm going to tell you about. Um, that and these are sections that um, take a certain value at the boundary of the manifold. So yeah, so if you have a uh, connected end manifold, let's say you have a compact manifold with boundary uh, that's connected, then there's this map, there's a scanning map. So in the case of um, the like free abelian group, the scanning map was a homotopy equivalence. 
Here, the scanning map is just a um, homology equivalence in a range. So the same as the scanning map induces an isomorphism and homology um, in this range uh, for you know, homological degrees less than k over 2. And you know, I drew a picture of the scanning map. I haven't told you what this space is. Um, I'll tell you more about the scanning map later. But so sort of the idea is that the, the space on the right is a space of sections with some bundle. So, you know, in the event that the bundle is trivial, the space on the right is um, a space of um, continuous maps. So this will be some infinite dimensional space. And this is some finite dimensional space, but it's growing with K. So, you know, if M is an N manifold, then the configuration space of K points in M is a K times N dimensional manifold. So, you know, as k gets bigger, this space is, um, you know, the dimension is growing and it's becoming uh, more and more complicated. And sort of the, the idea is that this, it, this becomes a better, this configuration space becomes a better and better approximation of this space of maps as, um, uh, k gets large. And so initially, the, the, this theory was used like, you know, we were people were interested in studying spaces of maps, and you know this, these configuration spaces were these small finite dimensional things. So the idea was like, okay, maybe we can the configuration spaces are easier, and we can use that to extract information about these mapping spaces. It turns out, you know, usually the flow goes the other way. You should think of these configuration spaces as like geometric and complicated, whereas like this space of sections is something that the standard tools of homotopy theory apply to. Uh, so it's easier to uh, study the homology of this space, and then that tells you about the homology of that space in a range. Uh, any questions? So I, I, I owe you the definition of this bundle. This is some bundle over the manifold. Um, it's not the tangent bundle. There's this dot here. So by n manifold you mean a uh, topological manifold here? Yeah, probably I'll assume it's smooth when I do the proofs, but okay. Yeah, and um, the construction of this TM does it assume uh, smoothness? Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. The, the construction I'm gonna give will use smoothness, but. Um, Probably, probably that's not needed. Okay. I want to get into like, you know, Spivak bundles and things like that. Um, or yeah, I guess the definition is definitely going to use smoothness. Um, but you can probably build a homotopy equivalent space. Is you know sort of what smoothness makes the tangent bundle a vector bundle. But we're not really using that it's a vector bundle. We're just using that it's a like a fiber bundle with fiber Rn, and that there are ways of doing without using smoothness. But that's some that's uh, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Yeah. And this this picture will um, make sense when I actually define the scanning map, which I'm not planning on doing today. But you know, it's, it is one of those, you have your microscope and you move it around your manifold and you see what you see, maps. Okay, so uh, what is this bundle? So it's a, it's a fiber bundle over M and the fibers are SN, and what, um, you know, or, or homeomorphic to SN, and what are they naturally? The fiber over M is naturally, well, the tangent bundle of M, so this is, um, you know, a copy of Rn, and then this um, plus means one point compactify. Yeah. So, uh, so intuitively, what you're doing is you're you know, so the tangent bundle is some bundle where at every point you ha you have this copy of Rn, 
And what we're doing is for you know taking the tangent bundle and then we're adding um, you know uh, we're adding to each fiber a point at infinity. So um, I guess for the, the 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 usual question for people who like know what the time space is but have forgotten what the time space is it, um the the time space is obtained so the time space you take the tangent bundle and you add one point at infinity so it's not a bundle anymore there's only a single point here we're adding a point at infinity in each fiber um yeah so what you should think about it is you should think about sections of the tangent bundle are vector fields on your manifold the section of the tangent bundle it is Basically, at each point, you have a little vector that, um, you know, points in some direction in your manifold. And sections of this um, fiber-wise one-point compactification of the tangent bundle, this TM dot bundle, are um, sections of are, are vector fields, except the vector fields are allowed to take the value infinity. So if you notice, this arrow goes off the page. That was... That's a, like a, was intentional. Um, yeah, so you should think of it as like sections of this bundle are vector fields. The vector fields can take the value zero, but they can also take the value infinity. And, you know, here we only have like one infinity. So you might say like in R2, maybe we want to have like a S1's worth of infinities. Well, here we, we're only having one infinity. Any questions or intuitively what this thing is? I'm going to, I'll define it using a formula, but... I don't, I think the formula might be less helpful than just um, saying you add a point at infinity in each fiber of the tangent bundle. Okay. Yeah, so I guess this maps is we're like given a configuration space, given a point in, um, given a configuration um we want a section of this bundle and i guess um the one of the models of the scanning map which is hard to make rigorous and isn't that useful but maybe is nice geometrically is you have this configuration you think of it as okay i got a bunch of points in my manifold how do I get a vector field out of that? Well, you imagine all the points in your configuration space are, are particles, are like electrically charged particles. And then you look at the electric field they generate. And what, why do we need to allow these sections to be um, infinite? Well, uh, you know, the vector field, you know, from the vector field that uh, a charge part, uh, like a, a point particle generates, takes value infinity at the particles. Um, you know, that's not the model I'm going to be telling you about, but that's, I don't know. That is like one way of thinking about it. And then the idea is, okay, you know, if this manifold has, has boundary, the boundary is maybe far away from all the particles. So the electric field is going to be like at least small near the boundary. Um, because you somehow, you, you don't, yeah. In this model, you maybe don't allow the particles to actually be at the boundary. And, you know, being small up to homotopy is the same thing as being zero. Um, yeah, we'll define a model, a, a picture that like looks more like you send your microscope around your manifold, but um, any questions? Um, I, I, I'm a bit embarrassed to say I didn't understand that because I don't know what electric fields, how, how like oh. particles generate electric fields. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so you know, so like, um, the uh, in, in ENM, if you have like a The, let's see, okay, how do I write in coordinates? So like, you know, if you have, 
a charged part of, you know, if you have a particle at like X, Y, Z, then uh -huh. you, you know, with some charge, you're going to get a vector field out of it. That is just, um, or I don't know. I'll say you have this, let's say this is, right. Wait. I'll just write with the tool. Okay. So you have some, Oh, wait, uh, Jeremy, this, you get, you're saying you get K vector fields. No, I'm saying you just add them up. Oh, saying, okay. Like, let's say we have charges at X1 and X2. That way. Uh, you know, and then we want to know what's the electric field they generate. It would be um, like the value at X would be like X minus X1 divided by the I see norm I don't know is it squared cubed mm -hmm. um that's, I see that, yeah that's good um, but, you know so it's like a sum of these things over all of the eyes right I guess I don't understand what the k notation in the sections the sub K so, means. So, yeah, so this is going to be degree K sections. So you say, like, I don't know what degree means. Exactly, yeah. Okay, exactly. so, um, yeah, so in um, in the paper where this is proven, uh -huh. okay, what degree is. And um, Mar Martin Bendersky and I wrote, like, some paper using this paper. And, like, Half of the difficulty was we needed to figure out what degree meant. Okay, good. So, I, um, I remember this uh, w when this happened. I was like, yeah, around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we knew what it was in parallel for par for manifolds where the tangent bundle was trivial. Uh huh. Um, and we had like proven a theorem, and then like we're just like, okay, this should work for all manifolds, and we just like couldn't figure out what degree was, and it just says like degree. The paper just says degree k sections. It doesn't say what degree means. Oh, I, I see. Are you going to explain this point? Um, like today, I'm mostly not talking about the scanning map. I'll quickly say what degree means. But, okay. Um, that's good. Yeah, that's what I was. But I'll, I'll try to rigorously define it later. And so, in my paper with Martin, we gave sort of geometric description in terms of transversality. But later, there was some other paper that like gave a rigorous homotopy theoretic description. Um, so I'll try to. Um, I don't remember what that is, so I'll try to look that up. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, the original paper definitely does not say. Um, yeah, this is it's the same paper that had the issues with um, the like quasi vibration argument. I see. Okay, good. Um, but this theorem is at least, or the, the proof of this theorem is true, even though it's not like what K is is not defined in the paper. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, but so like if you're an RN, this would be a, a formula for the vector field that charge is generated. And it would give you a way of thinking about the scanning map. That's not what we're going to use, but, you know, it's a way of thinking about it. We're going to like have more of a, you move your microscope around and you record what you see perspective. Um, yeah. Okay. So what is I saying? So, you know, intuitively sections of the, um, sections of this fiber-wise one-point compactification of the tangent bundle are possibly infinite vector fields. So we're sending a configuration space to a possibly infinite vector field. And then the statement is homologically, this becomes a good approximation as the number of points tends to infinity. Okay. So, you know, here's some formula for the tangent bundle that my impression is no one actually looks at. Um, you know, where you just cover your manifold with, um, with copies of RN and you, um, uh, you know, so copy your manifold, you, you cover your manifold with, uh, oh yeah. So I guess this is a formula that if we, if you crossed off this copy of RN, you're just going to get the manifold back. So it's just saying your manifold is a bunch of copies of RN glued together. And how do you build the tangent bundle? 
well, the way you build the tangent bundle is you add an extra copy of Rn and glue them together using the derivative. Um, so, you know, this slide has appeared like five times already in this course. Um, and so how do you get the fiberwise one-point compactification? You just replace this with an Rn. So, or sorry, with an Sn. So we want to just replace, so this is like the, the, um, the fibers of the tangent bundle and we're just going to replace them with spheres. Um, yeah, so we just replace it with spheres. And then um, linear functions act on spheres, preserving the point at infinity, also preserving zero. So if you say like, I don't know what it means, like the derivative is a linear function, I don't know what it, how that acts on spheres. Um, like you apply a linear function on Rn. If you have a linear function on Rn, it extends to a linear function on Sn, fixing infinity. So yeah, so we're just basically add one point in each fiber use the same definition. Um, but, you know, if you don't understand this formula, like I suggest you sort of think of it as like, it's, you know, it's tangent vectors, but we allow infinite length tangent vectors. Um, so yeah, so one thing to say is like, what, what have we added to the tangent bundle? Well, if you take this fiber wise one point compactification and you subtract tangent bundle, you're just left with a copy your manifold. These are like all of the um, different infinities that we've added. And, um, you know, so one thing to note is that this bundle has two natural sections. There's the zero section and the infinity section. So, you know, you send a, a point in your manifold to a point in the tangent bundle. Well, like, you, you could send it to the zero vector or to the infinity vector. Those are things that are canonically defined. Like, you know, if n is 2, if, you know, sending it to the vector 3, 7 isn't well-defined by these equivalence relations. But you, you can always, yeah. Uh, any, any questions? Okay. So, yeah. Um, so... This space uh, of section, you know, so this uh, the target of the scanning map is, you know, the space of sections and the superscript delta means that we require that the sections are infinity near uh, on the boundary. I guess it depends on what your model of the scanning map is. Sometimes you want to declare that it's zero on the boundary. Uh, if you use the electric field model of the scanning map, then you want to declare it's zero in this model of the scanning map that I'll tell you about later, it's more convenient to think of it as infinity, but either are fine. And um, so this is going to be the um, subspace of degree k sections. It's going to be a union of connected components. When the manifold is connected, it it'll actually just be a, a connected component of this space. So what is degree? Um, so if you know what like transverse intersection is, then you can make this into a rigorous definition. I'll give a um, um, sort of a non-geometric non description later. So what it says is, um, oh yeah, so the definition it says you count, um, you, you have some section here and you, um, you say it is, has degree K if it, if it intersects the zero section, k times counted with multiplicity. Um, so, you know, if you perturb it to be transverse, at least mod two, it'll be the number of times um, your preferred section uh, intersects one of our canonically defined uh, sections. So, you know, what, why do, do k points go to k, degree k sections? Well, should have had a picture. So in the, um, if you send this to a vector field, you know, so if you send your section to a vector field, how many times is the vector field equal to infinity? Well, it's exactly the number of particles is the number of times your vector field equals infinity. So, uh, 
th this this uh, electric field map will send a configuration to a configuration that uh, to, to or to a section so like a possibly infinite vector field that takes the value infinity um, k times you know where k is the number of points so in this you know electric field model um, what you do is you know the correct notion of degree here is you take your section and you count with multiplicity how many times um, your section intersects, I guess here the infinity section or in the other model, the zero section. And count with multiplicity you should think, you know, if you have a polynomial function, it's like the multiplicity of the root. You know, like, wait, you know, the count with multiplicity is the same way you count roots of a polynomial with multiplicity. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, I don't understand that much. What do you mean uh, that, how do you count the, the multiplicity? Um, yeah, I mean, so, um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll define degree rigorously later, but the sort of intuitive thing is you know if this is your you know infinity section and then you have um Jeremy can you put the slide where you defined uh degree just oh yeah let me yeah. just finish drawing sort of the picture that so uh the idea is like the red intersects the gray counted with multiplicity once, but that maybe the, gr the green intersects with like a higher multiplicity. So maybe, maybe the green intersects the gray with multiplicity two because it looks quadratic or maybe it's cubic. I can't, you know, I can't draw a good enough picture. Um, so there's a, you know, from the theory of sort of differentiable manifolds, you can always perturb two smooth functions to, uh, intersect what's called transversely so like the way the red and the gray intersect and then um there's a way of assigning a sign to this like either positive or or negative um yeah because like okay here's a um and then when you add up all of the ways of intersection with multiplicity you get um you get a number that's well defined up to homotopy so here, like the red and the, the red and the purple are, are homotopic in my picture. And um, the purple intersects the gray zero times, the red intersects the gray two times. But the idea is that, you know, this intersection maybe is a, a plus and that's a minus. And I haven't told you how to count that. But then when you add them up, you're going to get like the counted with multiplicity, the red intersects the gray zero times, and the purple intersects the gray zero times. And, um, so you get something that's sort of well-defined up to homotopy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, when we talk about the, the figure, scanning, uh, I'll define uh, it. All those cars agreed with this. <laughs> Sorry, the sound is bad. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I don't, I don't get how the, the, the picture on the torus with the vectors agrees with this because oh, oh yeah so the, the the idea okay so you know we're counting like how many times our section agrees with the infinity section right so if you look at these if you look at these arrows the arrows get bigger as you get closer to the um the point it's hard to draw you're thinking of them as charged particles, so it's like a um, uh, you know the uh, so are you are are you do you understand sort of the the claim that the value of the section at these configurations is going to be infinity? Yeah, yeah, it's like having a pole there. Yeah. So yeah, it's like yeah, you, or you could say yeah, send it to like a yeah, a vector field with a pole at those points. So it's um, 
you know, have a one-dimensional picture. So this is our manifold. And then we have, you know, this vector field that looks like this and then takes value infinity here, right? This. So if you were to um, graph this vector field, um, the graph of this vector field is going to look like, well, you know, something like this, right? Like if these are the x and y axes, the purple is the graph of the vector field. And so now we're asking, how many times does the purple intersect infinity? And the answer is once. But you need to like change change your perspective. So, um, yeah. So if you so uh, if you change coordinates, so now zero is infinity and infinity is zero, then the purple looks like that. And we're asking how many times does it intersect zero? And then it'll be once, and it'll intersect, um, you know, um, in an essential way. Yeah, makes more sense. Um, yeah I'll, I'll um, give like a homotopy theoretic description of degree that's less geometric, and also use a different model of the scanning map. Um, okay. Or just on the fly, I'm like, oh, I should just tell people about the electric field model. But, um, so, uh, Jeremy, when you when you do the electric field model, uh, you're saying for every point in your manifold, you have a vector field which has a pole at that point, right? Yeah, so there's one vector field, and it has a pole at each point in the control. Right. So, so are, are you saying? Are you saying? Um, uh, just a quick question: Do you does this vector field die off eventually outside the neighborhood? Are you yeah, choosing yeah, I mean, so are you choosing it in that way? Yeah, Maybe. yeah. Matt. What you should do is you yeah. should like put infinity, put the boundary of your manifold like infinitely far away from all the configurations. Right. Yeah, I mean, up to homotopy, like being small and being zero or the same. Um, you no, know, you, you probably this boundary condition you need to change to actually define the scanning map. If your manifold is not compact, yeah, but you can just think of your vector fields as uh, non-zero in the neighborhood. With a yeah, yeah, if you want, you can just make your vector fields up to homotopy. You might as well make your vector fields zero outside of a neighborhood of these points. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I follow when you what you mean when you say up to homotopy. Oh, I'm just okay. So in this context. Well, okay, so one thing, so let's say this bundle is, is trivial. Uh-huh. Then it's just right. maps from your manifold into a sphere. Uh-huh. And so you could say, I want, I want, oh, uh, I want these maps to have small value at the boundary, or you could say, I want them to be zero at the boundary. And saying you want them to have small, small value in the boundary means... They they map uh, points in the manifold to like some disk in the sphere, and saying there's zero at the boundary says they map the boundary to a point, and a disk and a point are homotopy equivalent. So I, in, insisting that, um, yeah, that the vector field is small near the boundary or, <laughs> um, I see. or at the boundary, you know, doesn't change the homotopy type of the. Base of sections. I see. This is a great. Okay, good. So, okay. So if if your manifold has Euler characteristic zero, then the degree is just like the differential topology degree. Is that right? Or so it, 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 the Euler characteristic zero just means there's a section of the tangent bundle. It doesn't mean it's trivial. Uh, manifold. I'm gonna oh, 
I, I, was, I see that doesn't mean wait wait all the way characteristic zero means that you can always deform something that does not intersect the oh. zero section right um or am i but i think it's saying this right i think it's i know what you're saying i'm slightly confused it's like these are sections of like a one point compactification of the tangent bundle so things might i see the Euler nice. characteristic is definitely relevant. Okay, it's okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm slightly... But like for the manifold, there are going to be degree, degree k sections for all k for every integer. So if you're, if you're, if this is trivial, the tangent bundle, yeah. if it's parallelizable, then this um, scanning map S would have uh, like the um, would have Oh, the, the section space would be just maps to the n sphere. Yeah, Is it would that... just be maps from a manifold to an n sphere. That you know. And then the degree becomes uh, the degree in this. You know, like on the map on top homology. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So like that's the slide that happened later. But yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Any other questions before I delete this? This picture, all these pictures. Um, does the intersection or like the winding number thing? Does that depend on? Do you need M to be oriented for that to be like well defined or? No. Um. It's possible that like my geometric description requires that M needs to be oriented, orientable. Um. Yeah. I'll um. Yeah, I'll give you a. I'll give you like a non-geometric, rigorous, homotopy theoretic definition of degree. Um, when you know, in the lecture when I actually construct the scanning map. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's like two things are going to cancel. So it's like going to end up being well defined. But I don't think it's it's not immediately obvious. Um, yeah, and it, it would have been nicer if this were, if, if like a definition of degree appeared in the paper, but um, I'm pretty sure whatever, 30 years later, we made up the right definition of degree. Um, yeah, but you know, you, it's reasonable to think you need orientability to define intersection or, you know, I'm not sure. I th I forget if you need orientability to make my definition of degree make sense, but there is a definition that makes sense, even for non-orientable manifolds. Okay. Yeah. So where are we? So you know, we've defined. Um, we've given like a at least a heuristic definition of degree and talked about why. K points might land in the space of degree K sections. And um, yeah, so the, the main theorem is that there's a scanning map. That's an isomorphism in homology and a range increasing with the number of particles. And so let's just sort of see what this theorem says when the tangent bundle of the manifold is trivial. So when the tangent bundle of the manifold is trivial, um, you know, so the, that means that you know, tangent bundle is isomorphic to the product bundle, just M cross Rn. So then sections just become maps into the fiber. So um, the space of sections is just the space of maps from the um, one point compactification of the manifold into the sphere. Um, or, you know, I guess if it's a manifold with boundary, you can say it's. Um, I guess here I'm thinking of as the interior of the manifold with boundary. I guess I could have said, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, they send the boundary or the, the point at infinity to uh, the base point in the sphere. And uh, in this case, degree, you know, has this description that Manuel just said, uh, map is degree K. So, you know, if M is a, um, M is already compact, then this group is just um, HN of M. 
Um, and so the tangent bundle being trivial implies the manifold is orientable. So this group is Z, and this group is Z. And then degree is just, um, you know, a, a section has degree K if the associated map is just multiplication by K on homology. And I guess, you know, you might say, okay, these are abstractly Z, which copies of Z are they? I guess degree is only well-defined up to a uh, choice of sign. Okay. Uh, any questions? So yeah, so in the case of, um, in case of, in case when the tangent bundle is trivial, this is just maps from your manifold into a sphere. Any questions? Okay. So um, we're we're gonna use this um, this theorem to compute homotopy groups of spheres. So let's sort of think about like what are um, you know. What do the configuration spaces look like in low degrees? So the configuration space of two points is homeomorphic uh, in Rn, is homeomorphic to Rn cross uh, Rn minus zero. So how should you think of it? Well, you got two points. This is um, this copy of Rn is like, where is the center of mass of the two points? And then this is what is the vector pointing from the point labeled one, to the point labeled by two. There's a typo, this is, Supposed to be ordered configurations. Any any questions on this homotopy equivalence? So it's it's saying if you have two points in R two, then that is the homotopy type of a circle, and the circle, um, you know, it's just like up to homotopy. The only data is like. What, direct, what direction do you move from the point labeled one to get to the point labeled two? Okay, and so now when you take um, unordered configurations, the points are no longer ordered, so you no longer have a vector pointing from one to two because you don't know which one is one, which one is two. Um, but what you end up getting is something homotopy equivalent to RPN minus one. So up to homotopy, the only information is um, is the line through the two points. You know, so you have extra contractible data like what it, where is the center of mass and how far apart are the points. Um, but up to homotopy, you just you know, the only data is um, what line do they generate, and so that you know a line in Rn is the same data. You know, space of lines in Rn is Rpn minus one. Okay. So let's um, let's compute some homotopy groups of spheres if, if we believe this um, theorem about um, configuration spaces. So we're we're gonna apply the, the theorem. We're gonna apply uh, we're gonna apply this theorem uh, in the case when the manifold is the sphere. So okay. So the tangent bundle of sorry, in the case when the manifold is R n, the tangent bundle of R n is trivial. Um, you know, the one point compactification of our manifold is uh, the sphere. So sections of the, um, uh, I guess I forgot a dot, sections of the fiber wise one point compactification of the tangent bundle is the same thing as maps from the, uh, you know, base maps from Rn compactified into Sn. So that's just maps from Sn into Sn, base maps. So that's, you know, the n-fold loop space of Sn. Okay, so um, two is in, the st is in the, if you look at the range in the theorem, um, so the scanning map gives you an isomorphism from H1, conf2, H1 of um, like the degree two component of this space. You know, pi zero, of loops n, Sn uh, is the same thing as pi n of Sn. That's how um, 
you know, these loops shift homotopy groups. And this is exactly Z. So, you know, the connected components of this space are isomorphic to Z. So this is just the connected component associated to the number two. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the calculation from the, or the observation from the previous slide says that uh, configurations of two points is homotopy equivalent to RPN minus one. And so, um, so in particular, H1 of this configuration space is H1 of RPN minus one. And then these are, you know, this is the homology, the first homology of RPN, depending on what N is. And, okay, so, oh yeah, any questions? on this slide. We haven't calculated homotopy groups yet. Things I should repeat or people want more time to process it. Yeah. So the, what this slide is saying is that this, the space of sections is just loops n s n and the h1 of the configuration space is um, given by this and you know that Oh, the scanning map is an isomorphism on each one when we have two points. Okay, so um, the, the last slide tells us that computes for us H1 of this loop space. So the, um, oh yeah, one thing to note is um, all the connected components of this loop space are homotopy equivalent because it's, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a monoid up to homotopy, it's a monoid with pi zero a group. And um, if you have a monoid and pi zero is a group, you can show that all the connected components are homotopy equivalent. Um, okay, so let's think, what is pi one of, of this uh, component of a loop space? Well, uh, loops shift degree by n. Um, picking a connected component doesn't change pi one. So pi one of, um, this component of a loop space is just pi n plus one of the sphere. So, um, yeah, so that tells us, it that tells us that pi one of this space is abelian because pi one is isomorphic to a higher homotopy group. I guess this doesn't work when n is zero, but I think we know the homotopy groups of S zero. So let's not worry about that. Um, yeah, so this says that when n is at least one, um, the fundamental group is abelian. Well, the, the abelianization of the fundamental group is homology, but if the fundamental group is abelian, then the fundamental group just equals homology. And that's what we've calculated. So we've calculated this group to be the same thing as H1 of RPN minus one, um, because the fundamental group is abelian, you know, that's equal to the abelianization of the fundamental group, but because the fundamental group is abelian, taking abelianization doesn't do anything. Um, and then this fundamental group of the loop space is the same thing as homotopy groups of spheres. So I guess at the end of the day, what we've calculated is that this is isomorphic to that. Any, any questions? Yeah. So yeah, the upshot is, um, the pi n plus one of Sn is zero. Um, I guess technically we didn't calculate that, but the n equals zero case is pretty easy. Um, yeah, so the just above the uh, you know so we get pi n plus one of Sn is zero when n is one, is z when n is two, and is um, z mod two when n is um, when n is bigger than two. Um, okay, so that you know that's one application of the theory. I'm not saying it's the easiest way of doing this calculation, but you know, it does tell you about higher homotopy groups of spheres. Any any questions? So, what one thing this allows you to do is you might say like, oh, this looks kind of mysterious, like. Why do we have a Z here, but then it becomes a Z mod two in higher dimensions? Well, it's the, this, this group is the same thing as just the homology of configurations of two points in RN. And the, uh, 
the generator of this homology group is your two points do a half twist. And if you're uh, two points doing a half twist in, in R2 uh, generates a Z because, you know, if two points do a half twist, uh, you know, a million times, you can't, you know, that's not, that's different than ha half twists or whatever. Like any power of two points doing a half twist is different from any other power. However, if you're in... Um, if we're in R2, sorry, if we're in R3 or, or more, and two points do an even number of half twists, if you do, you know, if you do a half twist twice, you do a half twist twice, that's like a full twist. Ignore the blue line. Ignore the blue line. Well, if you do a full twist and you're in R3, you, uh, that's null homotopic because you can sort of cone it off in the like using the third dimension um so like the the half twist is still non-trivial but that two times the half twist is um is zero and that's why we get z mod two instead of z for the higher homotopy groups any any questions yeah so i think I think this this picture is like why i four of s three is, is z mod two and not z. Okay. Um. Great. Where are we? Okay. Yeah. So um, what's like our, our proof strategy? Our proof strategy is um. We're gonna um. The, 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 this theorem of, of McDuff is really sort of two different theorems. So there's something called homological stability. So we're going to construct these maps. So let's we're first going to prove the theorem when the manifold is not compact. So when the manifold is not compact, you can construct maps that somehow bring in a new point from the boundary that increase the number of points by one, and maps that uh, increase the degree by one. And then we're going to sh we're going to show that in the limit, this configuration space and this um, space of sections have the same homology. And so this is going to use like the theory of quasi-fibrations and this um, generalization called homology fibrations. And it's going to be similar to um, you know, how we prove the scanning map was a homotopy equivalence in the case of free abelian groups. So just the idea is like when you send k to infinity, this is going to behave um, a lot like the free abelian group. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, um, to get, get back to finite K, we're going to show that the map T induces an isomorphism and homology in a range, and then also that tau induces that these maps tau are homotopy equivalences. The fact that tau is a homotopy equivalence is going to be straightforward, but it's going to be somewhat non-trivial to show that in a range, this uh, map T, which I'm calling the stable, which I'll call the stabilization map, induces an isomorphism and homology in a range. Um, and then if you combine these two theorems, you get um, um, McDuff's theorem. So I guess I haven't defined what homotopy colimit means, but basically you should just think of, I'm going to take this configuration space and send K to infinity. So we first, you know, or, so the, you know, the two steps are you show configurations of K points in a range is the same as configurations of infinitely many points, you know, defined appropriately. And then once you send k to infinity, that's the same as the section space. Um, and then those two comparisons say in a range, the configuration space and section space agree. Um, yeah. And then there's going to be some trick to go from the um, case of non-compact manifolds to the case of compact manifolds by comparing configuration space of points in a manifold to like what happens when you take the manifold and remove one point. Okay, so that's our overall proof strategy. So I'm going to tell you what this stabilization map is. So what it's, I guess I didn't write our code. Yeah, so this, we want a map that's, that takes in a configuration of K points in a, in a non-compact manifold and outputs K plus one points. So what do we do? Well, um, 
you know, this is a picture of the manifold M. It's a picture of the manifold M prime. So what you do is you build this M prime, which you glue on like a half open interval onto the collar. And so what we want to do is we want to add a, a point, but I, I can't just, you know, you might say, why don't you just add a point there in the purple? You can't just add a point in the purple. You know, you can't just add a point there because what if one of your configurations was already there? You know, these, these need to be distinct. In the free abelian case, you could just say add a point there. And, you know, if there's already a point there, just add their labels. But here, we need to avoid these other points. So what do we do? Well, we build this manifold M prime. And M prime is homeomorphic to M. All we did was we just added on, like, a little collar neighborhood. So now we know that there is no, you know, if you have a configuration in M, they're gonna, there's going to be no point in the, there are going to be no points in the configuration in the collar. So you can just add a point. So, you know, you get a map from configurations of K points to configurations of K plus one points in, um, in M prime, but M prime and M are homeomorphic. So their configuration spaces are homeomorphic. So what you do is you just sort of push this collar back into the manifold. Um, so yeah, so th this, this construction where you add a collar, add a point in the collar, and then push the collar back into your manifold is, um, is going to be the map that we show is a homotopy equivalence in a range increasing with K. Okay. So yeah, it was a theorem of McDuff and Siegel. Um, I guess McDuff proved that there is a, that this map is an isomorphism in a range, but didn't say what the range was. And, um, Siegel, um, Siegel gave the you know, an explicit range. Okay, yeah. So the theorem is that this um, this map on homology, the, the stabilization map bringing in a point from infinity, induces an isomorphism in homology in a range. Um, okay. So the um, the main tool that we'll use to prove this theorem is um, compactly supported cohomology. So um, I guess I didn't look this up, so hopefully this is true. If someone likes point set topology and wants to tell me that this is wrong, you know, interested. So, you know, if you have a, say you have a uh, Hausdorff pair compact uh, space, then and Y is some compact space, let's say compact Hausdorff space containing X, then um, the quotient of Y by... Um, uh, y by uh, y minus x is going to be the one point compactification of x. So, in particular, we have a model for the one point compactification of x, which is just take your favorite space containing x and mod out by all of the points you added. So, in particular, if y is the one point compactification, then y minus x is one point, and modding out by one point doesn't um, change your space. So, you know, in particular, the, um, the homology of y rel um, y minus x is the same thing as the homology of the one-point compactification of x. Rel infinity is the same thing as the reduced homology of the one-point compactification. And we're just going to define these groups that are all equal to be the compactly supported cohomology of x. Uh, so, you know, compactly supported cohomology is defined for more pathological spaces that don't have these nice point set topological assumptions, but um, I, you know, I don't care about those. So for me, compactly supported cohomology is just reduced cohomology of the one point compactification. And you can state um, Poincare duality for, uh, in terms of compactly supported cohomology. So let's say you have an orientable manifold which is the interior of a manifold with boundary, well, then um, the homology of the, the interior, you know, interior is homotopy equivalent to the manifold with boundary. Uh, and then Poincare duality says that that's the same as the homology of the manifold rel boundary. Um, you know, but that's the same as the, um, um, you know, 
or whatever. Like both of both of these two things are examples of things that are isomorphic to compactly supported cohomology. So yeah, so if you have a, a manifold without boundary and you and you want a state Poincaré duality sort of intrinsic to the manifold without referencing the boundary, you can just say that the i homology is isomorphic to the n minus i compactly supported cohomology. Um, yeah, so this is just another way of rephrasing Poincaré duality. You know, there are versions with twisted coefficients, etc. Um, okay, so um, one nice property of um, compactly supported cohomology is there's a long exact sequence. If you have an open subset, there's a long exact sequence involving um, oh, you know, open subset of X. There's a long exact sequence involving X, the open subset, and the complement. Um, so how do we see that? Well, this is just a long exact sequence of the pair you know, given by um, like X, if this is right. Uh, yeah, so I'm confused. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I think because M is open, you get a well-defined map like this. Um, I'm confused by what I wrote. So, um, yeah, but um, yeah, so this long exact sequence is supposed to just be a long exact sequence of a pair coming from, um, yeah, so I guess you should think like this is X, then you have, you have U in here, and then, um, um, I'm slightly confused. Okay, so what are these, these groups? Okay, so I guess, yeah, the claim is that, I think this is right, but I think I'm just confused, but, okay. So, yeah, and then I guess X plus, we're just adding this point at infinity. So we, we you get a map from um, x plus minus u into x plus. Um, and so I guess that gives us a map in cohomology going the other way. So that gives us a map in cohomology from x plus to um, yeah, okay, so we Sorry for being confused. So this this group we're saying is the same thing as the homology of X plus rel uh, X plus minus U. Because this is, um, you know, we can pick any compactification con containing U. And, you know, in fact, maybe it would be better to say it's the reduced homology. And then this, we're thinking of, because U is open, the, um, because U is open, X minus U, uh, compactified, is going to be the same thing as X compactified minus U. Um, and that tells us that this term, so this term is the reduced homology of, um, oh yeah, 
sorry, cohomology, reduced cohomology of x plus minus u. And you know, this is this term is just the this term is just the reduced. reduced homology of um, of the one-point compactification. Okay, yeah, now I believe this. Yeah, so just the long exact sequence in cohomology, when you rephrase it in terms of compactly supported cohomology, has this nicer description. Any questions before I delete this? Yeah, so what's um, what's nice about this is that we can recover the compactly supported cohomology of x from uh, u and x, x minus u. So normally, you know, when you're doing Meyer via torus, you have two you have two subspaces whose union is the entire space, and you're studying the homology of you know, let's say you have um, let's say x is a union B, when you, um, you know, and you're using Meyer Vitoris, you need that A and B intersect, and then you're studying the homology of X in terms of A and B and their intersection. That's how Meyer Vitoris works. But here with compact disorder cohomology, we are taking a space X and writing it as a union of two other spaces, U and X minus U, and the spaces don't intersect. So we don't need to worry about the intersection. Somehow compactly supported cohomology knows about the intersection. So we get, you know, a long exact sequence, just like literally we chop our space into two pieces and we don't worry, you know, worry about their intersection. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, the nice feature that we'll use next lecture um, when proving homological stability. So one, one you know, Somewhat annoying thing is that um, in, in compactly supported cohomology, it's not homotopy, not homotopy invariant. So, you know, the compactly supported cohomology of Rn, that's the same thing as reduced homology of the one point compactification. And so, you know, uh, whatever, R, Rn one point compactified is Sn. And the homotopy type of Sn like, clearly depends on n. The homotopy type of Rn doesn't depend on n. So, you know, when we take compactly supported cohomology of Rn, you're just getting the reduced homology of Sn, so you get a z in degree n. So it depends on n. So, you know, it, it sees more than just the homotopy type of Rn. Somehow it's like seeing the homotopy type of the boundary or like the points at infinity. You know, so S, Rn really has like an S. Sn minus one at infinity, and this compactly supported cohomology knows about that. Um, yeah, so it's not um, this functor is not homotopy invariant. Um, oh yeah, so in the overall proof strategy, we're going to um, well, we're only going to prove it when m is a surface. I'll sort of sketch how to. Um, deal with the case of higher dimensional manifolds. Uh, yeah, and we'll also assume I'm orientable, but I'll sketch how to deal with non-orientable manifolds. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Poincaré duality to reduce it to a statement about compactly supported cohomology. Then we'll reduce it to the case the manifold is Rn. And then we'll use compactly supported cohomology to reduce it to connected components of um, the um, free monoid on R2, and then we'll use that the free monoid on R2, like the, the connected components of this are manifolds, to use Poincaré duality to reduce it to the, um, the homological stability for uh, the connected components of this space. But this space is just homotopy equivalent to N, so all the connected components are contractible. So homological stability for the connected components of N is obvious. Um, yeah, so this is sort of this is our proof strategy. Uh, it'll take, I think, like all of next week, probably to prove homological stability. This is an overview.
Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to mention, you know, so the ranges, the, the ranges are sharp. So if you think about it, like um, configuration space of one point in Rn, well, the configuration space of one point is just the underlying space. So our configurations of one point in R2 is just R2. So H1, the configuration space of one point in R2 is zero. Uh, the configuration space of two points we saw is RP1, you know, that's S1. So H1 of the configuration space of two points is Z. So, you know, so this map is not, so no map can be an isomorphism because this group is zero and this group is Z. Um, so this is just outside of uh, the range. So we definitely, you know, it's not that like Siegel and McDuff were being lazy and this map is just an isomorphism in all degrees. Um, you do need K to be sufficiently large for this map to be an isomorphism. You know, and this should maybe make intuitive sense because when you send, um, you know, as k gets bigger, this is a manifold of more of larger and larger dimension. So, you know, um, you wouldn't expect, like, if you wouldn't expect that, you know, if if uh, you're interested in homology and degree a million, uh, and k is small enough that this space is a manifold of dimension less than a million, you're going to get no homology here. But once K is big enough, then your the space will be like over a million dimensional, and then you can start having homology and degree a million. And so then there's a chance that the map will be a nice amorphism. Okay. I'm going to um, say I have like two more slides on ordered configuration spaces. They're not super necessary. so or they're sort of tangential, so people can feel free to leave, but uh, I think, you know, I might run three minutes over. Oh yeah, any questions before I talk a little bit about ordered configuration spaces? Yeah, so for, for ordered configuration spaces, you might say like, do we have homological stability? And basically, you know, at least uh, naively interpreted, the answer is definitely no. So if you look at the configuration space of um, k points in R2, k ordered points in R2, uh, then the first homology group is uh, z to the k choose 2. So what, what are the generators? Well, we have k points, and uh, they're generated by the loop where the, you know, um, you pick uh i and j in the set one through k and then you have the ith point go around the jth point um yeah um so yeah so for each uh each pair of points you get a um you get a loop so in the unordered case this is just one loop the unordered case, like, there is no third point and no fifth point. So, like, third point going around, you know, there's no difference between this point going around that point and this point going around that point. But in the ordered case, you can distinguish all of these loops. Um, so you might say, like, or not that relevant, but if the fifth point going around the third point, that loop is the same as the third point going around the fifth point. I think you don't, you, you don't get a sign according to Nick's advisor, you should like think about like if two people are dancing and they're like going around in a circle and that should tell you that the sign is positive. I, I never understood that. Maybe someone understands why the sign is positive. They can tell me. But yeah. So like the homology grows. Um, but you know, there, there are some theorems. So, uh, the, the homology grows, but the, homo the growth is, um, is somewhat controlled. So um, just for convenience, let's let's work over a field. So um, so let's say we have, we have a manifold and it's connected and its dimension is at least two. Then for each i, there's a polynomial that just depends on i and whatever field you're working with and your manifold. And the polynomial has degree at most two i, um, such that 
per k is sufficiently large, so I, um, 8i minus 2 works. The um, typo this should be ordered configuration space. Um, the homology of ordered configuration space agrees with this polynomial. So what this is, theorem is saying is that like maybe in the beginning there's some noise, but then eventually um, the like the Betty numbers. So you know the dimension over um, over your favorite field f is exactly equal to a polynomial. So this is sort of the analog of stability that eventually is just equal to a polynomial. Uh, and so and, you know and the degree of the polynomial grows with i. So for example. Um, the previous example, assuming I know what n choose 2 is, says that the um, homology, the dimension of the homology of uh, the first homology of k points, k ordered points in R2, is equal to this polynomial. I guess n should be a k. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry for going over. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, but if people have questions.